All righty. So it is 510 on the East Coast, and it's time to Is anybody here uh, for the first time? Any any brand new people? Somebody who missed uh, last time? Although we, I think we uh, we had twenty five people here last time, so that's that is everybody. Uh, but maybe there were some changes to registration for someone. Or, nope. We go way back <laughs> two days. All right. Um, so what's happening today? And by the way, before you get all worked up uh, and worried, I will say this. Uh, what we're discussing today is not going to be on the test. It might be in the test of life or your career, possibly. Um, things might, names that we talk about today might be good for you to remember just to be, you know, an active participant in the, in the, in the visual field. But um, they're not going to be on on the midterm or the final for this class. So there's no need to memorize dates or even names or styles or anything like that. I think this is just great stuff for you to know, uh, to, uh, to see, to think about, to research further. Uh, there's, with any of the people that I, I talk about today, there's tons of stuff online. Uh, so I, it's not like I'm you know, introducing some secret information here but uh it will be summarized into about an hour maybe 50 to 60 minute lecture here and um some of the names are very well known some are less well known and they do have something in common which is that they all combine geometry with art and that's this is where our story begins so let's rewind back about a hundred and ten years about and um, let's go back to what used to be known as Russia Actually, uh, Skyler, very good idea. Oh, by the way, thanks again for that uh, logo. I, I did write you back, but I, I, I took my time. You know, I savored, I savored the image, and uh, you can bring that back up uh, when we talk about point symmetry. Uh, but let's go back to a country they used to call Russia, and then they, then it was called Soviet Union, and now it's called Russia again. So I guess. Uh, we could just say we're in Russia now. And back in um, about 19, 12, 1913 or so, um, there was a young artist uh, whose name was Kasimir Malevich. And he was uh, sort of how should I say? Uh, he was kind of fed up with what was going on. Uh, he was fed up with things uh, socially. He was fed up with things politically. He was fed up with things artistically. And one of the things that really bothered him was that everything was kind of boring. And for artists, this is a good starting point. Uh, there were lots of schools of art, you know, in the late 19th century, early, early 20th century. There was, there was a lot going on artistically. There were many schools of art, many thoughts. We could do this, we could do that. You know, you could use this technique or that technique. But he wasn't into any of it. In fact, he said, it's kind of boring that everything is a picture of something. Everything represents something. I look around and all, all the stuff in the museums, they're all pictures of landscapes or still lives or portraits or, you know, just the standard stuff. Maybe somebody did it a little differently, but there's still pictures of things and people. 
So he started to do something different, totally different. And here's an example of his way of making art. Uh, he started his own school of art called suprematism. Now, suprematism sounds very um, sort of um, aloof and like he's putting himself on a pedestal. Uh, like his art is supreme to everyone else's. That's not uh, what you should be thinking. And that's not why he named uh, named it suprematism. In fact, I don't think he was beyond anybody. Um, from what I understand, he's sort of a humble, humble guy. The, the reason he called it suprematism is because he viewed, as I do, and many people do, he viewed geometric forms as supreme to anything representational. So basically what he thought he was doing is he was bringing back, and he did, I shouldn't say he, was, he thought, he knew he was bringing back the fundamentals, uh, the geometric forms um, that were discussed, you know, early on by by the early you know mathematicians in in Greece and and um, wherever, and he he was interested in in just combining those geometric forms into interesting looking pieces. And now whoever wanted to look at it, fine, that was great. Whatever you wanted to think about it was fine. Uh, it's great. Whatever you wanted to feel about them, everything's fine. But he just started making this this kind of art. So you look at this this one from 1916, 1917. He didn't really date his stuff, by the way. Uh, he made lots lots of art, but yeah, he didn't really document them very well. I wouldn't be surprised if some were found, you know, even even to this day that that hadn't been uncovered yet uh, somewhere in St. Petersburg. Uh, so this piece that we're looking at here, just just very typical of his stuff. Um, the technique used is not anything to write home about. Um, in fact, a lot of these have kind of sloppy technique, to be honest. Uh, he would leave pencil marks and, you know, the, the paint's very uneven. And I'm sure that the canvases weren't like the best quality or anything like that. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there. That's, that's not important at all. Uh, what's important is that it's brand new. Uh, I mean, honestly, even more than 100 years later, this, this feels fresh in a way. Now, some of you or somebody might be thinking, oh, I could have made that. I'll make that with that up in Photoshop in just a few minutes. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but you, know, you your, your challenge is not to remake this, but to, to make something else that's new. This was new when, when the time came, when in 1916, nobody nobody was doing this. And like I said, all the art represented something. Then along came Malevich, and as you'll see, a couple of others, but Malevich was the first. And they started making these non-representational pieces. And that's huge. If you just think about that for a second. They started making things that didn't actually look like anything. But what do you what do you think of this? What what do you uh, any any thoughts? Uh, any anyone want to share your your take on it? Whether it's the way it makes you feel, the you know what you think about the colors, what you think about the shapes. Uh, do you see something in it? I think his intention was usually not to represent anything in particular, but sometimes he did. I like how it's yes, balanced. Yeah. Oh, like yeah, there, Fiona. Yeah, there's just balance in 
something that it shouldn't that has really no symmetry and stuff but he still used like fundamental elements of art to create something that is not representational of anything really but i don't know i like it i think it looks yeah cool. it's 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 more like a mood creator and a very nice nice um yeah balanced uh piece that would probably fit most apartments and at least anybody who likes that kind of uh modern touch i mean and, and modern i mean like pre-modern or whatever what, what they would what, retro modern um they would call this uh, i mean russian avant-garde is what became uh what that movement became to be known as russian avant-garde from the early 20th century and um it is abstract abstract meaning non-representational right and that's that's the key here that that's that's one reason why we're looking at this the other reason is that this was made with geometric forms uh, you've got uh, some rectangles there you've got more of a linear element there uh, you also have this um, this circle or disk here and uh, kind of in the background um, and then there's one element that sort of breaks the mold do you do you see what I'm talking about there's one element that doesn't seem to um, be like the others is it the teardrop shape yes that's what I was thinking yeah and some of these people would would often do that um, that they, they would kind of toss one in uh, just just to just to make it interesting so yeah it looks like the all the other elements are I guess you could call them uh, non freehand uh, uh, elements but then there's one that's more like freehand drawn freehand so these other ones are more like uh, ruler and compass like if you know making straight lines with the ruler or or in, in case of the uh, the circle you know you could make that with the compass but then there's this one freehand piece that fits nicely I mean it, it really works there uh, but you know maybe I don't know some someone else might not have thought of putting that in you know if there's a rule in place like you can't do freehand then you know maybe you don't think of somebody might not think of uh, breaking that rule All right so this this is not one of his real famous works although I mean he's he's known as uh, somebody who who put the wheels in motion for something really really big uh, he, I don't think he was thinking that and that's not why he called it suprematism again suprematism is because he just he felt so strongly that geometry and, and forms like the triangle or, or line or rectangle they're they're just they reign supreme um, over anything that actually looks like something like a face or a mountain or whatever this next one is um, a more famous piece you may have seen it have you seen it anybody uh, this this piece is on display um, it's it's on display wait a minute um, at the MoMA and it's not that big and you will easily walk by it but there's a th there's a real revolution happening here uh, and, and not to not to even you know put a fine point on it but if you look at the year 1918 there was a real revolution happening like you know and a, a war and a and a real upheaval uh, of the world war uh, one the first world war and one of the things that was happening was 
is that the Russia that Malevich knew uh, became something else. Uh, it became the Soviet Union, and uh, people, uh, and artists in, in particular, but many other, I mean, everybody basically had to live uh, under very strict guidelines. You could only do certain things, and it was kind of like the way I, I like to think of it is like almost like everything got destroyed it's like a nuclear blast and and there's nothing left other than the, the cockroaches maybe and then so if art started you know from that cockroach scene then then what would it be like this this to me is what it would be like it'd be geometric forms it's kind of white noise you know that your ears are ringing from that blast and and you know it's not like you're you're not seeing anything really i mean it's all just barren right and and uh but but geometric forms still exist the circles the squares and so this at least that's that's how i i how i look at this and um it, it was very powerful it's still powerful and, and and nobody had done anything like it. Uh, so white on white, still considered a very important piece, and probably will always be because this this was the beginning of this abstract art movement. And not only that, but it was the beginning of something greater, which um, which I'll uh, get to in a minute. Has anyone seen this at the moment? Well, next time you go, uh, please stop to look at this one. It's it's on there and probably will always be there. Uh, so a very, uh, yeah, it was the start of something. And you could just see the potential in this kind of thing. Like, I mean, never mind even about you know, how it makes you feel or whatever. It's just that uh, what it might be or what, what it's supposed to be. or I don't think it's supposed to be anything except what it is. And, and it's different things to different people. And that, that's, that's one, of the, one of the keys about ex abstract art is that you know, it, some shapes might be inspired by actual things. But for the most part, uh, they're, they're just plays with form. And as such, they're much freer, much, uh, you know, they're left up to interpretation in, in a totally different degree than uh, representational art. And that was new. In fact, all art, for, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, I, I'm not an art historian, uh, so uh, you've got to give me a little a little bit of leeway here but from what i understand all art was representational before malevich got started now i will mention the islamic artists uh starting you know in the 900 you know mid mid century uh 10th century uh, mid 10th century uh 930 940 or so um uh, thank you, Skyler. They uh, they started creating art with tilings that they would put on floors and, and walls of buildings and outsides. So that kind of thing dis uh, discounted, uh, which you know, by definition really wasn't supposed to represent anything. Uh, but that this is a thousand years later, and. Uh, it was revolutionary. Now, this next piece is kind of sad. So here's uh, Malevich's self-portraits. Uh, I don't know how many he made, but um, there are two here. One is from 1915. 
so before the revolution, before the uh, Soviet Union became what it was. And then one is in 1933. So this is quite a bit later. And what had happened is that Russia became Soviet Union. And in the 20s, I don't know the exact year, but in the 20s, they realized that artists are becoming a bit of a problem. The government, that is. When it, when it was they in Russia, it was, or in Soviet Union, it was always the government. They decided, you know, the government, people in the government decided that artists are becoming a problem. They're getting real political. They didn't like the communist re uh, regime so much. Uh, for the most part, and they did something completely unthinkable uh, in, in these, actually, these days, I, I can't even use the word unthinkable anymore because it seems like that that's kind of the norm. But let's say in 2019, this would have been unthinkable. The government forbade abstraction. They said, from now on, uh, every art, every piece of art has to represent something. Now, what could they do to enforce that? Well, they would just stop giving people money. So artists, all these official artists like Malevich uh, and, and many others were supported by the government. Everybody was supported by the government. So everybody would essentially work for the government and get paid by the government. And that was part of the communist deal. Now, they would say, if you start making stuff that's abstract, if we can't figure out what it is, then we stop paying you. So then you just, I guess, go hungry. And obviously, that's not a good option. So what happened is there was a split in between the artist community. Uh, some people decided, you know what, that's just crazy, that's too much. Uh, they're they're in, infringing on my artistic freedom. Uh, in fact, there was no artistic freedom at that point. So I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going to escape. So that was about half of them, you know, half of the big names. And then the other half of the big names just said, ah, whatever. I, uh, I'm comfortable where I live, and everything's kind of okay, so I'm just going to keep living in Soviet Union and just change my style. So Malevich was one of the ones that changed his style. So he went back to his roots and you know started doing landscapes and whatever else. Uh, and here's a self-portrait of him. In 1933, this is just a couple years before he died. So yeah, it's kind of a kind of a sad story there, uh, because for my personal taste, uh, that left one is, is just a lot cooler. Because, well, for one, if if you didn't tell me, or if I wasn't told that it's a self-portrait, I wouldn't have even known that. But knowing that he wanted to be a self-portrait, it, it does kind of make sense. You know, it's like, you know, he's sitting or, I mean, the, the piece is kind of, you know, the, it's kind of funny, actually. But it, it could be many other things, too. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know what... Uh, what, what else to say about the, what do you guys think? Uh, I mean, it's obvious that I think most of us would not be interested in living in a place where artists didn't have freedom, or creators didn't have freedom. But uh, what, what else comes to mind when you look at these, these two self-portraits? So I know you said that he um, passed like shortly after the one on the right. Um, so, so we just like never did abstract art ever again. 
Ah, ha, ha. You bring up a wonderful question. I'm, I'm going to answer that with my next slide. Okay. But you know what? I could even answer that with this slide. Because if you, if you just look at him for a second, I mean, he doesn't even look. Like, that's not a normal pose, right? I mean, who who does it like this? Maybe Napoleon did it like this. But notice how he's making that right angle with his thumb and his hands and his fingers. I think that's the kind of thing. And, and, and the triangle, um, what do you call this, uh, the, the collar, the triangular collars. And the, it's just kind of real rigid, geometric uh, look to his shirt. And that right angle there, I think, is just a, like, hey, I can still do this. <laughs> you know, just like, kind of like sticking it to him a little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. You know, as much as he can, you know. It's, That's cool. I like I that. I, I don't know if you guys have seen that uh, Monty Python movie where the, the two knights are uh, fighting and uh, uh, one knight uh, chops off uh, an arm from the other one and it's bleeding cr like crazy and it's like, ah, oh, I don't need that arm. I can still fight with one. So then uh, he chops off his leg and his sec uh, other leg and so then this, just his torso with one arm. He's like, oh, I'll take you on. And uh, it's like, that that's all he's got left is one arm. And of course, the, the other night chopped that last arm off. And then he just started running his mouth because that's what he's got left. This is what Malevich has left. And so he's, you know, he's still with the geometry theme until the end. And then actually, it, it, Taylor, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and what a timely question, because he designed his own coffin. I know it's a little morbid, but this is the coffin that he came up with. He wanted to be buried in this thing. And it's like this last laugh kind of thing, isn't it? Um, it's like, oh, yeah, you're going to punish me? <laughs> I'm already dead. Go ahead. And... You know, here we are talking about, this, uh, you know, really a hundred years later, almost. And um, it, it's important. You know, he he stuck to his guns in his mind, like, you know, he he kept he kept the fight at a certain level, you know, like as much as he could in that um, uh, under the circumstances. So yeah, uh, geometric forms were huge for uh, Malevich, and um, and he's definitely a, somebody worthy of discussion even today, uh, because he he really was the first to start pushing this abstraction idea, the idea of the geometric forms uh, being supreme to, to anything else. And so yeah, that was that that was his legacy, and then this this just kind of seals it off. Um, this, I, I think this is just fantastic. Now, Malevich is not actually that well known uh, throughout the modern society. You know, if you're into art history, modern art, whatever, of course, uh, you you would have heard about him. But uh, the next person is more of a household name, and that's uh, this guy uh, Kandinsky. Sorry about the microphone. So Kandinsky was more of a household name. Uh, even back then in, in Europe, and you know, he became a big name here in the US. And uh, one of the things one, one of the things that made him such a big name is um, that he moved. You know, he actually left the Soviet Union. And he started doing his, he, he stuck to his um, artistic philosophy and he, he was able to develop it uh, to a very, very high degree. In fact, he was an art professor. He, he was, in fact, you know, for decades, uh, he was an art professor at a school that everyone's heard of. Um, Do you guys know which school I'm talking about? 
Does anybody know? Would it be Bauhaus? It would be Bauhaus. Thank you, uh, Mateus. That was that's exactly it. He was one of the founders of the Bauhaus uh, School of Art. Uh, he died in the mid '40s. I don't know if that had anything to do with the 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 Second World War, uh, but certainly he he died at that time. Um, so uh, he, yeah, it looks like uh, he taught at Bauhaus from 1922 until the Nazis closed it in 1933. He then moved to France, he even became a French citizen, and uh, died in 44. Uh, so Kandinsky was more, um, I guess musical, you could say, and just the more detailed, the more refined, and one might say more interesting. Yeah, yeah, Sophia, that's this. Like I said, this is kind of household stuff, or at least um, uh, closer to it. You know, when it comes to art you know, from from Russia or or Europe at this time, and. Um, There's, there's just a lot to say uh, about this, but can, does anyone want to offer some uh, some thoughts? One of the things that I like I like about this uh, is that it seems to defy this notion of dimension. It's not like there's like a plane and then there's just some stuff on it. It yeah, it's very chaotic and they they don't seem to be like on top of each other so much as like in a different dimension almost on different planes and and not necessarily in some kind of parallel order uh, the musicality of it uh at least part of it comes from the fact that he always paint to music or with music on and in fact his pieces were usually based on like one specific piece of music so like for instance this one his favorite um, his favorite composer was uh, and I think I think they were friends um, Wagner and composition Eight. Um, let me see if I could find the specific piece that this this what this was modeled after. Uh, hmm. See that the. Um, quickly uh, perusing an article um, called When Music Meets Abstract Painting. Now, com this Composition 8 is actually in, uh, in the Guggenheim. And Guggenheim loves this artist, by the way. Uh, they often have shows. Th th sometimes they, they do the whole museum with just Kandinsky stuff. I, I think they just have uh, a warehouse full of his his art, and and of course they borrow from collectors. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know um, which piece that, that this came from. But uh, I hear so Wagner was his first sort of musical connection. But then uh, another composer called Schoenberg, and so the music helped him elevate his his uh, compositions to a, to a different place and I'm sure he taught that to his students at, at the Bauhaus um, the colors everything seems to go well it's, it seems more academic in his um, approach even to balance um, but there's there's something in common 
actually quite a few things in common with the uh, the Malevich stuff. By the way, they were they were contemporaries and they were friends. Uh, Malevich is the, the first one. If, you know, if anybody ever asks uh, who was the first you know, modern artist to, to use abstraction, uh, Malevich would be a good answer. But Kandinsky became the bigger name. It's kind of like uh, in the Seattle grunge music. Uh, Mudhoney was one of the first, if not the first, grunge band, but Nirvana became the big name. This is before your time. By the way, there is this decade called the 90s before you were born. And uh, in Seattle, there was this musical revolution. That, that's kind of how this was. Kandinsky was the Nirvana. Malevich was the, the earlier bands. Malani, all the others. Uh, so what, what kinds of parallels can you draw between this piece by Kandinsky to um, to the stuff we saw with uh, Malevich. Can you see anything? I'm going to draw your attention to this piece right here. See, again, everything here is you could say ruler and compass, right? So no freehand stuff, except for that squiggly thing, right? So that that I, I like finding things like that because they, uh, uh, I mean, they, one of the things that they'll do is is they they um, are kind of reminders of the artist's intent. Uh, they you know, there's a rule, but then they love to break it. And it's, it's nice to see that. Plus, it creates a little bit more life to the thing. So Kandinsky, uh, again, he moved to Central Europe and, and was painting freely. Yeah, this he was actually a professor in Estonia for a while, too. And, in Germany, France. So this would have been at the Bauhaus. Now, we come to what who's probably my favorite of, of the big names from that period in Russia. Okay, we're still in the Russian avant-garde uh, group. And uh, this is another contemporary of Malevich and Kandinsky. And somebody who was more of a Renaissance man than, than a fine artist. And it, this, this person turned out to be uh, of, of huge influence on what was to come, um, not just in the art world, but basically uh, the modern society. Now, why is that? Um, well, yeah. See, that's the thing with, and, and I, we could look at all of his photographs, and you'll always see something very geometric, repetitive. Whether it's lines, or or cir circular stuff, or you know other geometric forms, the geometry is always present, and it's super powerful. It's not subtle. Um, but obviously, with the people there, you know, it's it, it also brings that uh, human touch to it. It's it's a it's abstract, but it's also not. And uh, yeah, yeah, those are those are steps. But it actually doesn't matter that they're steps, but they are. Uh, it, he chose these. Uh, subjects for his photographs where it's not clear what it is a lot of times and it's not even important it's just that the the form of the uh, the display is, is what's important so Vrachenko was was really huge uh, here's another one 
I just picked a couple in random. This is an awesome photographer. Uh, but where he really started making a huge difference was things like this. Now, this looks kind of rudimentary and, and kind of, um, well, just real basic, uh, you know, by today's standards. But this is a book cover. And uh, he, he started doing these, uh, you know, side gigs as a, uh, as an ad person. Like he, he started making advertisements and book covers and matchbook, matchbox designs and posters and stuff that graphic designers do these days. And this is where it's huge. So he took what Rochenko, I mean, uh, what Malevich was doing, and some of what Kandinsky was doing, but mainly the, the Malevich's initial jolt in that abstraction, uh, the direction of abstract. But then he started making them sort of uh, street-like, not, not such fine art stuff. And he started combining elements like photographs uh, with these more geometric designs and making them notice that he could be in Russia making or Soviet Union making this stuff because it's actually it, it's it's something it's not technically abstract so this, this this was all fine and you know good and and this is a an ad for a bookstore and you know they might have printed out you know thousand copies of this thing and then they'll they'll post it all over town there's an address there this is there's an address um, this here is this uh, knigi meaning books and uh, there's some kind of little uh, little byline and then that's an address and uh, you know this this sort of thing didn't really exist before like an artist making something for the masses something that didn't just go to one person or one place uh, you know, collectors wouldn't have bought this stuff up this was just uh, posters for everybody to look at and see that that's starting to sound a lot like uh, what we consider now you know, advertising and and uh, graphic design in, in particular and so you in my mind He's, he's the father of uh, graphic design. So if, if anybody here is thinking about going to graphic design, um, look this guy up. You know, his name is uh, Rochenko. And here's a little nod. I found this, uh, uh, this is a record, record cover. In fact, I'm not sure if it's on this album, but uh, there's a video for, um, that's the name of that song. Friends Ferdinand had a had a hit song. Um, oh, you guys know? Um, Friends Ferdinand, take me out. I don't think we have time to to watch it right now. But that the video for "Take Me Out." So that's um, that video is like. Um, Uh, real uh, explosion of, of avant-garde uh, with, with a good song to boot. So that's, that's fun to watch. So that could be your homework. Take me out, the official video. Okay, so let's now move on to, um, to, to more uh, current artists and, um, or let's say later artist uh, this guy Richard Serra unfortunately died recently but uh, he lived a full life he was an American uh, artist and in, in fact uh, a lot of the galleries in Chelsea really uh, uh, focused on him and uh, put his stuff out he made these for instance uh, uh, 
one of the things he's known for is these these massive um, constructions like this, very geometric and and very cool. In fact, I was walking into you see this uh, this little big. They're actually really really big. So this this piece right here was in a in a show in Chelsea. I think uh, the gallery is called uh, Gagosian. Gagosian Gallery. It's one of the only ones where they could fit something huge like this. And I was walking in right around here, and I bumped into somebody because you know you you're always coming around the curb. And I said, "I'm sorry." And he, he we kind of looked at each other, and it was uh, Harrison Ford. And uh, not that's there's not much of a story here, but it was just cool to bump into like a surprising face in the middle of an art piece. I, that's never happened to me before. So this kind of a little uh, personal history I have with this. Um, anyway, Richard Serra, Saul Lewitt, who also recently passed, unfortunately. Uh, this piece is cool because, well, again, you know, it, it could be anything whatever you desire it to be. Or maybe at first you think it's something and then you change your mind. That's cool too. When I saw this at first, I kind of thought it was moody, like some kind of moods. But then it occurred to me that it could be seasons. And just, just based on the the temperatures of the colors, it could be seasons. I, I don't know, but that this certainly looks a lot like summer. And uh, you know, maybe that's spring and fall and winter with the, the brighter blue. But well, maybe it's not that. But it doesn't matter. I, I like it. Here's some more LeWitt stuff. Now, we're going back in time a little bit. So this is in the 60s. You might have heard about this artist, uh, Victor Vassarelli. Do you know what school of art he was in, or what group, or what category, if you will? So huge in the 60s. Op art. Um, that was short for uh, optical. And um, he was one of the main main characters in that. But there were there were many others. And you know, all of it's very geometric. It could have been created with computers, but it wasn't. Um, I, they, we didn't really have computers at that time. Maybe 20 years later, it would have been. Uh, but there are lots of great stuff, um, all of it very geometric, and all of it sort of um, tricky, how should I say? Uh, I think that's, like it, that there's always a little thing, some shtick, some, uh, something to think about. But it's just geometric forms. So whatever you're imagining, your eyes are kind of letting you go somewhere, but of course these are just um, these are just two-dimensional two-dimensional things. Now, <laughs> this is kind of ridiculous, but I I wanted to kind of cover the gamut, you know, from the uh, Malevich's you know pencil drawn, you know, even when you go to the MoMA and you see that white on white uh, thing. You're gonna see the pencil marks. You're gonna see him like where he did it real kind of haphazardly. I'm not even sure if it's an actual square, and it's it's very uneven and just real um, organic looking, I guess. So this is the opposite end of that. So when the computers came around uh, in the '80s and uh, especially '90s, some artists, or probably more like 
physics guys or computer people that were into art they started going nuts with this and uh, so the, here's here's something that uh, would generate any kind of sculpture on the screen you would just you know check off different uh, features characteristics here's some uh, here are the uh, the sliders you know for this one's for the colors and this is for the different different parts of it you know how much warp do you want to give it and all that stuff so then when you come up with something that looks cool then you make that yeah, it's a very mathematical um, thing that you come up with and so it would it would for these people it would first make sense to create this mathematical object on screen and then you could tweak it until it looks good and then you can actually make it out of something uh, this is made out of wood and it is really cool but it's it's very very uh, pretty far from what um, what Malevich was doing but in the sense that that they are you know uh, birds of a feather you know geometry and art this is very deliberate very uh, uh, complicated and and uh, so sort of real, you, know, you you might say it's a little contrived. It, it's it's a little bit like uh, forced, but it is pretty and it is very uh, perfect and symmetrical and all those things. Yeah, you know, these are different uh, surfaces that uh, would come up in mathematics, and you could tweak it until it looks somebody might enjoy looking at it and then you can make it and now of course with 3d printers uh, this would be even easier i'd rather look at the hand-drawn one personally but this is this is something neat okay then we come to a couple of my current favorites um, so this guy uh, tony is is actually a friend of mine from Finland, but he's here uh, in New York and, and he's all over the place, but he's mainly now in New York with the pandemic. And um, uh, you might have seen his stuff because it's all over the place. Uh, so this is in Jersey City, but you know, there's so much and it's so current that I, I thought I would actually uh, show you uh, more of his work and um, I was actually gonna ask him to join us today maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, see if he could talk to us next week just for a little bit just to say hello or if you guys have any questions he's uh, somebody I music with and real just a real talented guy so let's see uh, da -da -da. so this you guys see in the website uh, so I encourage you to look around if you're interested uh, Ruben 415.com so he's, he's super nice humble guy and um, you know, his, his stuff is all over Manhattan but especially Chelsea and, and downtown that's that's the artist himself there he's done a you know, many many things that um, that have you know commercial significance, uh, like for instance a bunch of Starbucks and and uh, hotels, something like this you might have seen somewhere in Manhattan and, and thought it was kind of cool. Well, anyway, so it's uh, it's my friend Tony. This is the one my, I had in the show. This is on Houston. A lot of his stuff goes to private collectors. That it, he's great at using those geometric forms to create a mood. I mean, these might be a little bit more deliberately representational uh, 
than than some of the other stuff we saw today. But uh, they still, you know, very well fall into that geometry and art um, umbrella. Some sculpture. I like this one because it's this actually has some 3D elements. Yes, very cool. So yeah, Ruben four one five. Uh, now, let me go back to um, my file that I was sharing, and if if only for one more slide. So this is probably my favorite artist um, from you know who's who's around today. Uh, actively doing stuff. Uh, have you guys heard of Oliver Eliasson? So look him up. Or actually, I'm going to go through some of his website. Yes, he's he is known. Uh, you know, maybe not. Uh, uh, you know, he's not like Banksy or anything. But uh, I think he's. <laughs> Way more complex and interesting, although Banks is, you know, in his own way, super amazing. Actually, I don't. It might be her. I, I don't know. Nobody knows. But um, Elias' son is just fantastic. How he uh, he goes way beyond this merging of geometry and art, uh, and there's there's just a lot of commentary, most of the time without any words. And I thought that I would actually go through his website, which I mean, there's no way I can go through the whole thing. But <laughs> one, one thing, his, his website is actually probably a revolution in itself. Uh, and if you haven't been there, I highly suggest you go. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you now, but there's no way I could actually uh, go through the whole thing. So Oliver Eliasson's website. Uh, so when you first come in, you, oh, I wasn't at the top. Um, so you see this, um, uh, you know, some takes here and there. You know, he's been active for, I don't know, 30 years maybe, 20, 30 years. And he's actually from Iceland, uh, you know, from my neck of the woods. I actually lived in Iceland for uh, a while. I was working at the university there, doing some research and teaching. Uh, now, this guy actually also lived in uh, Denmark. So I think he goes by Icelandic Danish. Something like that. Anyway, so here's some here's some uh, sort of uh, portfolio stuff, kind of you know, stagnant stuff. And then you realize, what's this rock doing over here? <laughs> what what is this thing that keeps following me? Let me click on that. And this is where it gets interesting. I've never seen anything like it, actually. Um, so he's done so much stuff, and there's just so much material in this archive that I guess he, he he figured out a really cool way to be able to for people to be able to search it and so one one way to go through the stuff is to um, you know just look around like this and that's fine and you can point point to things and it, it's all very geometric but just phenomenally uh, beautiful to look at. But then I, th I think where, for me anyway, it gets like just uber awesome is when you go to this connections part. And what it does is it gives you tags. And he was already doing the tag thing like a while ago. So I don't know that there's a lot. Uh, 
let's see uh let's let's go for um what should we do uh, geodesic so here's stuff that's geodesic and then we can do another one let's see actually let me pick something that has a little more in it uh, how about oh this is not all the tags that's why oh um like sphere let's see do we have a sphere in it oh yeah go with sphere so that's got a lot and then let's combine it with um, something else, like um, how about five-fold symmetry? So now we have a couple of tags, and then we have this overlap, right? And then you can go in any direction with it, right? And uh, Let's see what's spherical and has five-fold symmetry. Have you guys ever seen the web archive like this? I mean, maybe everyone's doing it now. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, it kind of blew my mind when I first saw it. Anyway, uh, we're, we're quickly running out of time here. But if, if you want to uh, uh, get more acquainted with this artist, I, I would highly recommend it. Oliver Eliasson, and uh, there's a ton of stuff out there. There's videos. Yeah, this he's at the cutting edge, not just with the art, but also how he's presenting things. And is you know, it's when you watch him explain his stuff or explain how things were set up, and he has shows all over the world all the time, and it's he's phenomenally creative and and. Uh, uh, efficient. Uh, I think he he has a few people like working under him, you know, setting up the exhibits and everything like that. And, uh, so, because he, you know, he seems like he's always got exhibits like a couple on, on at the same time. And there's certainly been a bunch here in New York. So, you know, anytime uh, you can go, uh, please go. Um, I've seen his stuff a few times. My favorite one was at the PS1 one time where he had the whole whole place. And um, yeah, great stuff, great stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, that is it for me. Um, oh, oh, we might have time for, uh, we might have time to watch the video. I wonder if you'll hear the music. Let's let's try it out. So let's let me see if I can uh, play you this video. Can you guys hear this okay? Could you hear the music? Uh, okay. Well, I I think I would just uh, yeah you know this 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 has been the the stumbling block for this Blackboard Collaborate Ultra is this playing videos with sound. Um, so I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna beat my head on the wall uh, head against the wall. I'll I'll just let you guys watch it. Uh, on your own time. Now, the, the the video is quite entertaining. It's very steampunkish, but it's also an homage to um, Rochenko, in particular. So uh, watch it with with that in mind. And um, that's it. Oh, oh, one more thing. Uh, 
there's a book that we're going to be uh, using throughout the semester. And um, it's not absolutely crucial that you have it next week. I can take some copies of the pages, but I'm not going to be doing that all semester. So uh, symmetry, shape, and space. I could send you a screenshot of it. Actually, you know what? Since I have you here, I'll just do it like this. Uh, symmetry, space, shape, and space. And it's fairly, it looks like there's even a PDF available. So you might want to look into that. Um, are you guys seeing this? This is what the book looks like, OK? So um, 26 bucks from Amazon, but you know, maybe there's another way to get it. Uh, I don't know. It, it, during the usual semester, it's kind of easy for people to share a book, but you know, not so easy right now. I remember when Amazon was just a bookstore. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I was around to see that. Actually, it's not that long ago, like 15 years ago, maybe. Anyways, um, that is it for me. And uh, I hope you guys have a better idea now of some ways to infuse geometry into art. Um, no, you don't have to buy it. If, if there's a PDF available online, which I don't know about, and if there is, there, it might be illegal. I don't know. So I'll let you guys think about all that. I have a copy of it. I, I don't have it uh, on this table right now. But um, it you should have access to either a digital copy of it or share with friends or rent it or to just because I'm going to be assigning homework from it from time to time. OK, so in, in that sense, this is like, like any old college class. All righty, so yeah, I rented for 20 bucks, symmetry, shape, and space. Uh, it's on the syllabus. So if you go to the uh, course information on our Blackboard, check it out there. Okay. OK, thank you. You guys good? You guys going to have a good weekend? You promise? All right, I will see you on Tuesday next week. Thank you. Bye, Professor. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much.